Our text is 5, 6, and 7. Paul has so much more to say than has ever been said before. Number one, because God gave it to him. And number two, because the Spirit of God had come and he gave, he's given us an understanding. Now, uh, it was given to Paul. He gave it to Paul and Paul distributes it among the brethren. Now, did we know this is the manner of the kingdom because Jesus, we can look at it and see now Jesus, he blessed the loaves and the fishes and he gave it to the apostles and he, they distributed it among the brethren. See, this is what Paul is doing here and Paul is effectively, he's kicking the feet out from under these men who have come into the congregation and, he, and, he, and he's led his brethren astray. Now, uh, what we're seeing here, Paul is, uh, he's effectively He's uh, preaching the sovereignty of God, and, uh, and he's taking the guesswork out of all of this. And, and you know, uh, Paul has had a lot of work of this done, uh, a lot of this work done for him, before him. See, a lot of this has already been established way back, way back, when holy prophets of men have come along, and they, they were quick. To, to identify the Lord as the sovereign God and, 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 and these things. Remember what Jeremiah said, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Solomon said, uh, the, the preparations of the heart is in man, and the answer of the tongue is in the Lord, or is from the Lord. A man can make all kind of plans, all he wants to, but the end result, you see, is from God. Yes, men, they walk. But not of their own choice. It's what the, our brethren are telling us. Men do a lot of talking and they do a lot of planning, but God controls the outcome. Yeah. This is what James is talking about, brethren, in the fourth chapter. He condemns men as, as though they behave, that they really can do what they plan to do, you see. For, for we ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. See? That's right. Religious leaders have lost their way. This is part of my introduction. The prevailing leadership, I'm, I'm, the dominating leadership have lost their way. The mainstream, uh, it, uh, these men, the religious community, they've lost their way. They, they've forgotten this very basic fundamental thing, haven't they? That Paul is going to speak of the one who sits upon the circle of the earth. One who's working his purpose on the earth. He's called man to come alongside in this work. No one really knows but God. But don't you sense, really, when we think about this kind of thing, as a little bit of a, uh, a side note, but when I, when I think about this situation that we're in now, brethren, don't you have a sense that there's a lot of, there's a lot of church folk, I guess you would, I suppose you'd call them kindred spirits, but that, they're, that they would be set free if they knew about Babylon? That, that they're, they're just stuck there and they're unsatisfied and, and, they're, not, and they're not really willing, but, you know, you know the situation. I, I think there will be a great number, an untold number, that will be, will be freed from this enslavement once they see the truth. Now, verse 5, uh, Sarah read for us, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but minister by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Even as the Lord gave to every man, what Paul is saying, we just said, no one gets anything from God that God does not provide it. Simple as that. And as Paul points out, God has servants and who are directed by him to give what only God, only what he can give. Uh, provisions, they're, they're intended for the people of God. The saints are the ones who minister them to one another. This is the way God does it. In, the other, in other words, if you've been given, giving, if you've been giving what God has given you, then you're a minister of God. That's what he intended for us to do. Who is Paul and who is Apollos? Who are any of us but just servants of God who minister to the Spirit of God, those provisions, those things that come from him. Paul's also saying we are only men. We're just men. We can do nothing of ourselves. Paul and Barnabas lived this out. Remember, they were in Lystria. They, they fled to Lystria, actually. They preached the gospel there. They preached the gospel wherever they went. And while they were preaching, Paul, he spotted a crippled man in the, in the crowd. He was born a cripple. He was a grown man now. And the Spirit said, who never had walked. Paul, perceiving him to be one who had faith, he saw it in him. So he called him to his feet. 
When the people saw this, they cried out, The gods have come down to us in a likeness of men. The people again, they ran and they shuttled about. They were going to offer sacrifices to Barnabas and Paul. But they had to stop them, actually, saying, Sirs, why do you do these things? We are also our men of like passions with you, and we preached unto you. We're just ministers sent to you, actually the God of heaven, of whom we preach. He healed this man. We didn't do it. And Paul continues to preach to them concerning the long-suffering of God and the witness of his kindness throughout all the nations. Yeah. Uh, it's easy for men, you see, to ascribe the blessings of God to those who bring it to them. But Paul and, Paul and Barnabas, they take this pretty serious, you see. They rent their clothes. They tore their clothes and ran in among the people telling them, God of heaven has done this. And then he continues to preach telling them of a salvation that comes from God. Well, you know these things. And all the brethren who are living by faith know these things. These things that are going on in the world, all, this, all these e events and these circumstances we read about and we hear about him, God is behind all of these things. He is a caretaker, brethren, of all these things. What do you think of Job, brethren, when he see, told his wife in the very beginning, what? Shall we receive good from the hand of the Lord and not evil? Job knew exactly. Hey, this is a wonderful thing. He knew exactly who was behind all the good things and as well as uh, the calamity that come to him so suddenly. Who could bring calamity so quick? You see, Paul Job was thinking, only God can do this. It had all the earmarks of God working. Went, did run thing after the quick succession. Job, Job knew exactly. The will of God is seen. And his salvation. You can see it, how, how he's working. It belongs to him, brethren. We know that the Son of God, he brought it down to man. The Son of God brought it. And the Holy Spirit, he makes the application of these things, of, of that salvation. He, he applies what Christ has done to the hearts of man and to this world. So then it's God. God is handling all of salvation. That, that's for sure. But that doesn't mean, as Paul's getting around here, uh, men are not involved. And as we consider salvation, we think about it. It's like we talked about this morning, Brother Jason brought this. It's very big. It's very big. And all the way we can really get our hand along is to break it down in these kind of uh, subtopics, as you, if you will, to, so we can understand, understand, because it's so very big. But we want to make sure this is clear, that the, the purpose of God's salvation, we want to make sure this is clear, that uh, there is a lot going on in what God has been done. Uh, but it's his salvation, and it's, it's, more, it's, it's more to it than uh, saving men from the wrath of God. And uh, this is just actually saving men from the wrath of God. This is just a small fraction of what's really going on. Uh, now, on the final day, we'll be overjoyed, brethren, when the heathen are removed from us. And we'll be overjoyed, no doubt, that we have escaped the, the fires of hell. However, we all know. This brother knows salvation is bigger, concerns bigger things than these. The emphasis of religion all these years, so much our dismay, it has been, it's been what we've been saved from, what we've been saved from. But, uh, but when the real work of, of salvation, the real uh, message is what we're being saved to. That's what right. we're being saved. Right. It's high That's time right. that this message gets out, brother. That the, so the glorious message, as Brother Asian said, this, the glorious message of what we're being saved to. This makes up the wonderful news of salvation. We know that God, or what we know what God is doing. We know this. That cannot all, cannot all be about those things that we are being saved from. We know this because God has involved men in the work, you see. God has called men alongside the work with him. Each of us are working together towards that end, our salvation, that purpose for which we've been saved. God is superintending our salvation. And he does not work independently of our participation, that's for sure. You quit participating, and then you just dropped out of what God is doing. And you, do, you can sense this. Amen. In salvation, God has designated, and he, he really, he has. He has determined for men to obtain spiritual life. Yeah. Uh -huh. By taking hold of it, you see, puts it within your grasp through taking what he gives. And then making it their own. We can make it our own. Jesus came to give life to as many who would receive him. Yeah. To as many as the Father gave him. To as many who partake and abide in Christ. 
spiritual life that the Lord gives. It is this life. It is, it is this fact of this life that excludes us from condemnation, the wrath of God, the spiritual life. It's so important. It's so important uh, that what, what God has given, the spiritual life, it's so, he wants us to keep it. He wants us to take it and keep it. It's a stewardship is what it is. It's a stewardship of the spiritual life that will secure our salvation in the very end. We're talking about the Holy Spirit, brethren. We, the Holy Spirit, actually we've been sealed. We talked about it this morning also. We've been sealed with this Holy Spirit of promise, Paul says. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until God redeems his purchased possession to the praise of his glory? This spiritual life that God gives, he intends for us to take it and make it our own. He takes it to take hold of. It's the, it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And you know the spiritual life, it has certain qualities about it. This aspects, the aspects of which are outlined in the epistles that are given to us, mostly by the Apostle Paul. We are, car we are partakers of it together, this divine nature, spiritual life. The scriptures teach that all the children of God are partakers according to the gift of the Spirit. We're all taking part, brethren, as we work and labor. Paul says, ministers by whom ye believe in our text. Now, we're talking about in the things of God that the Spirit enables us to do these things. Jesus, you know, he gives uh, many parables, and one he gives is about the householder. I like this, and I'll bring it up occasionally. He went out early. The kingdom is likened to the householder. Went out to hire laborers for work in the vineyard. He started early in the day. Five times he went out different times of the day, hiring men to work in his vineyard. There's a lot of these parables scattered out throughout uh, God, uh, Christ's ministry. It depicts the nature of the kingdom as a progressive working kingdom that was already brought up in our testimony at the time. Jesus' own testimony adds to this record of the working and the, and the movement, the general movement of the kingdom of God. Jesus said, my father works, I work, which means all those who are connected to God through Christ Jesus, they work too. Yeah. In some places, the scripture says labor. There are things to be done that work. There are things to be done that are wearisome. Labor. Labor is a harder, it's a, it's a harder work, labor is. But we're called to this. Edification, the building up of the saints is what the body of Christ does, which means we all work then. But we sure don't want to be uh, someone's labor. <laughs> when we're talking about labor in the kingdom, we sure don't want to be a labor. Uh, who in the world wants to be uh, wearisome labor to the saints? You remember what Paul had to write. I, I, I got this feeling that a lot of the things he wrote he wrote when he was weary of the brethren. This same letter, he was probably weary. At, in Galatians, he said, he, I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. He, he was, he was uh, laboring there in Galatia and, and Corinthians. Sometimes it's work, sometimes it's labor, and a lot of times we feel like it's our lot to, to have a lot of labor. You have to work for what you get in the kingdom. And for those who have learned that we have to work in this world, then it doesn't come to any surprise, it doesn't come to you as any surprise that you gotta work for the things of God. He teaches us that right here. A lot of men preach in our day in such a way as to characterize the kingdom of God uh, requires very little effort at all. That's what they preach. It's like it's almost effortless. If you could just make it down the aisle, brethren, you know. Uh, that Jesus is going to give us something for which we have not worked for. Uh, when Jesus himself taught, labor not for the meat that perishes, but for the meat that endure, endures to everlasting life. They preach a, a kingdom of God that is easy, uh, which is uh, it's laced with all kind of earthly goodies along the way. Every creature in heaven is working. You can know they're working because God works, see? And uh, that why would anyone think that we can come in Christ and I have to work our, our way all the way to glory? God's working, and in fact, he works all things together for those who love him and call according to his purpose. He's working. As partakers with God in the work, we're admonished and exhorted to stand fast in the faith of it. That's work, brethren, to keep that which God has given. It, and that's given for the work. That's why it can't be given for the work. So that salvation can be evidenced in us that we should be to the praise of his glory. 
And God who is able, God who is able, he shall confirm you to the end. Now, you work real hard is what he's saying, and God will confirm you to the end. This is the participation that uh, I'm, I was talking about. Are you convinced that God has every good intention for increasing his kingdom? Are you convinced of that this morning? Can you be more encouraged this morning that God has an abundance for the people of God? The fact of increasing is something which Paul states here comes only from God which means it will not come by any other means. That's obvious. It will not come through any efforts of men alone. That's why what I'm saying. It, it, you can't rely on just men to bring this to you. We certainly want, don't want to distract the brethren with anything other, with any other things. Don't distract them for, from a pursuit of God with other things, for only he can give the increase. Faith is able to make a connection between this text and the personal good fight of faith. Yeah, a lot of things we have to have faith to, to hook them up. And God, that's what it's for. Faith will assure us of God's involvement, his involvement in our own salvation in these things. As, we, as we've already said, in the work of God, men are just merely working along side with him. We sure need God when we're trying to do something. Without his involvement, we could do nothing. If we don't learn anything else, we learn that from Jesus. The world... Uh, including the religious part of it, they speak of progress and advancement. That's, the, that's their, uh, uh, that's their uh, key words. I, I was looking for something different, but that's what I do. That's their key words, progress and advancement. But the body of Christ, well, we speak in terms of uh, increase and growth, yeah. you see. Yeah. Uh, men are fond of public, publicizing uh, programs and progress, proclaiming and promising advancement. And that's, that's kind of the... And, but uh, the religious community, they do the same thing. They measure themselves by standard of uh, progress and advancing in things only men can do. And, but in relation to the things of God, in, in terms of salvation, the uh, spiritual life, the scriptures always speak of increase and growth in, in, in terms of like fruitful and bearing fruit. Associating increase with God, what God does. Increase in the, in the in spiritual realm. This leaves men completely out, you see. Men cannot bring increase in the spirit unless the spirit of God is with them. Men are, are noted for all kinds of things today. Uh, don't want to dwell on it, but you know what I'm talking about. But this is what uh, religious men have to offer one another. A lot of strife and divisions and, and just a lot of denominational kind of things. But uh, we don't want to have anything, anything to do with that. Uh, on the final day, God's going to show. He's going to show everyone what he thinks about all this. And right now, we want to make sure that we're siding. We want to be on God's side, that we're siding with him on, 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 on these Amen. things. We want to, like, what I'm trying to say, really, is that we just want to get as much distance as we can between what God is doing and these, these other things. Uh, only the spiritual things are going to survive on that day. Men cannot bring increase in the spiritual things of God, no matter how hard they try. Yes, but that's been designated to the work of the Spirit. And everything Paul's addressing here with the Corinthian brethren, he just got through with it in the earlier part, those are things which concern the Spirit. The saints, we have a good God. We have a God who is good. What he does, everything he does on the face of this earth is good. In the body of Christ, he is more than good. He is rich. Unto us in abundance and abounding portions, which means our access to God is on the increase. This is for the saints of God. Salvation in particular. Now, God is addressed to do many things, many, many, many things, and none of them are skimpy little things yeah, that God's right. doing. They're not like the minimum. It's like we said this morning. We're not just barely being saved. Yeah. God is not. God has called us for increase. And it's always been this way, brother. God, God, when he, God approached man and when he dealt with men all the way from the very beginning, he did it in an abundant way that everybody would know that these, these men, these ones I've called and chosen, they've, they've, been, dis, they've been separated and they have a distinction of their own. The testimony of the scriptures is the people of God who he has called and chosen, they were distinguished and set apart from the other nations by increase in abundance, they were. It was always according to the work they were doing, and it was always, and, it, and, and most often it was a spiritual work too. 
God has always equipped and made the saints ready for what he was asked them to do, the task that he prepared for them. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sojourned in the land. Remember what God told them. He said, walk. Walk the land the, through the length of it and the breadth of it, and I will give it unto thee. So they journeyed through the land. God added to them. God increased them. All this increase is what marked them as the people of God. These men were not only wealthy in material possessions, they were, and they were also rich in faith. Faith did not qualify them, though, for these great material possessions because God gave them both, you see. He gave them the faith, and he gave them all the material possessions. Because he wanted to. God did it because he wanted to. And because the purpose of God allowed for him to. And, and he did it. These brethren of whom we speak, they had become partakers of what God was doing. They belonged to him. And the heathen world knew who they belonged to. You remember the record? The combined herds of Abraham and Lot. They had become so great they couldn't dwell in the same area together. They had to split up. This speaks of the favor that God gave Abraham and Lot. The increase as, as, he dwelt, as, as they dwelt among the heathen nations. When Abraham departed out of Egypt, chapter 13 of Genesis, and Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. But the truth of Abraham's increase, brethren, is really seen in the, in the true wealth he had, which is illustrated in Genesis 13, uh, 15, 1. Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. And again, by what God himself declares, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And then Romans 4, 3, for what said the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. If Abraham was sojourning in the land today with us, even in this time, he would, have been, he would again be known for his increase and his abundance. He would be known as one who was uh, in possession of the riches of, of the glory of God in Christ Jesus. He would be known for that today in this time. As we travel and we sojourn in the land, we can be known for the same things, brethren. The inability of man to live unto God, even when he has promised to bless them for it. This has been the case all through the record. God had Moses write a song about it. He wanted the children of Israel to know it. Put it in their mouths yeah. that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel, that they'd all know it. For when I have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers that flow up with milk and honey, and they have eaten and filled themselves and waxed fat, they will turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my commandment. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befall them, this song shall be a testimony against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination which they go about even now before I have brought them into the land which I swore. Now, God is good about God is good on his, on his uh, promises. He Amen. makes good. God makes good on his promises, brethren. Amen. This song of Moses, this is a prophetic word, incidentally. I mean, immediately it's about the nation of Israel, but then again it's about all flesh too. This 32nd chapter describes how God in the beginning, he set up the boundaries of man and he did it according to the nation of Israel, by the way. It was according to the, to the nation of Israel that he set up all the boundaries of the other nations. We're talking about increase and, the, and God's willingness to abound unto his people. God was assigning the territories and all, all the uh, inheritance of the nations according to them. The song of Moses is given to the people and God said will serve as a testimony. He found them in a, uh, a desert land, in a waste, hallowing wizard, a wilderness, and he led them about. He instructed them. He kept them as the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirreth up his nest and floodeth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings. He taketh them and beareth them, and beareth them on his wings. The Lord did this, see, that all these good things he poured out on his people. He made them the nation of Israel. He made them around the high places of the earth and that he might increase uh, of their, their fields and their, and their work and their labors. He made them to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flint. God gave them uncommon uh, provisions Amen. and increase. Things that uh, was uh, not expected. God, God gave it to them. They were a nobody people. What they, and, and they were just like in a nowhere place. 
but see that God, he took them from this, from this, he calls it a howling waste of wilderness desert, and he kept them like a mother eagle keeps her youngs. Mm -hmm. And God took them, took them on his wing and, and did this, and he, he, uh, he increased them inside of the nations in an uncommon way. Now, this word of Moses, it contains a very encouraging uh, prospect, an encouraging word for the brethren there. But it was really just a, a, a telling forth of what was to happen to them because, because of the flesh. And the seed that fell unto good ground brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold and some sixtyfold and some thirtyfold, Matthew 13. There is a place contrary to this. There is a place where the word of God increases and the work of God is multiplied. There is a place that this takes place. And, uh, and according to the scriptures, brethren, we can identify this to be the place. Or it can be the heart of uh, every man who is filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. We can identify this with the scriptures. In Acts chapter 5, right after Ananias and Sapphira, you remember that incident? They went, had been separated by God from the assembly. The scriptures say, right after this, the scriptures say the apostles were daily in the temple in every house. They ceased not to preach and teach and preach Jesus Christ. And we're looking at the, the, the intention of the Spirit and the work of God, the Spirit's willingness to increase and multiply. Containing, uh, continuing in chapter 6, in those days, when the, right after this, in those days when the number of the disciples had multiplied, there arose a murmuring among the Grecians. And the twelve called the multitude together, all of them, the whole body, and instructed them to choose from among them a number of uh, seven men, uh, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. I want you to choose among these men. And the apostles, they, that's what they've done. They chose seven men from among them. The apostles received these men. They prayed with them. They laid their hands on them, and they turned them over to the work of the Lord. Now, what is the response of the Spirit of God in this matter? And the word of God increased, and a number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith Acts 6-7, it's immediately uh, uh, followed this. And the word of God increased means that the effect of the gospel that they were preaching, was it was effective upon the hearts of men. Mm -hmm. And, that, and there was, this was the occasion for the increase, that what they were preaching and what they were saying it actually affected the hearts of men. That uh, what a marvelous thing to consider that this took place. God had caused his kingdom to increase. What he done, brother, if you look, he, he provided for a circumstance in, in the congregation there. And the apostles, they told the brethren, you, you, they, this is how they, they solved the problem. You pick out from among you capable and spiritual men. They tell them what to look for other than uh, uh, men full of the spirit and men full of wisdom. They, they, you pick these out, and that's what they done. The increase, you can see, was a it was a direct response uh, from the Spirit in overcoming the circumstance that rose up in the assembly. You see, the saints didn't make a big thing of this. They didn't, like, divide over it. And they didn't split up over this thing, but they, they approached this thing, and they had the wisdom to handle it. And they took care of this matter, and the Spirit, God was pleased with this. And, and, and they did the right thing. God was pleased with it, and he blessed them. And, and we know, brethren, that this, we can look and we know that uh, pleasing God is a very important thing, Amen. you see. And it's going to have a lot to do with what, what we hear on the final day. Uh, we, can't, we can't really speak too much about this, knowing what to do, knowing the right thing to do, and doing it like these brethren did there. Amen. Because so much depends on this. So much depends on us because we're, we're required to figure so many things out personally. We're not talking about other brethren. We're talking about ourselves. We're all, all the time uh, engaging cir certain circumstances that we've got to figure out. They can be tough things. Jesus told his religious leaders, sometimes these circumstances can be tough things. But you've got to figure them out. Remember one, remember one time Jesus told the religious leaders, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice. And then he said to them, go and find out what this means. Yeah. Well, there's some things, brethren, that God, we're faced with. God requires us to just go out and find out what it means. You know, we just, we had to, we had to preach them. We had to preach these things in a way that will help, brethren, figure these things out. They can take them 
and figure them out. And we don't stop preaching, by the way. We just continue preaching. We don't quit preaching till God tells us to stop preaching. We just keep right on preaching regardless. Because this is the way we're all being saved, the preaching and teaching. All of this preaching and teaching and ministering to one another, this is the way God has chosen to increase us and add to us. We don't stop until God tells us to, and that's what we're waiting for now. We're waiting for that final word when God shouts from glory. And so we keep preaching, speaking, to, speaking of the way that God would bring increase to us. Now, you know, even before Acts, we read this incident here, but even before Acts, we have times when men of God added to men of faith. We had talked about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That, uh, and it's other men, men we, don't even, men we don't even know of, brethren we don't know. In chapter 11, there's the time, we won't have enough time to name the, the, those who, who have, uh, God has increased and blessed. But you, we can, but you, you know this, can anyone, can a, can a people be put in, into God's hand that they do not prosper? Can that happen? Can God shine his favor on anybody and, and they not increase and abound? God, I don't think God can put his hand to a cause and it not multiply. I, we know that's not true. Jacob prospered. You remember we went through that record. Jacob prospered in the, at the hand of Laban. Despite Laban, actually, Jacob prospered. Now, it's so obvious what's his increase that his sons. The sons said, Jacob has taken away everything that our father has. Yeah. But, you know, God, Jacob didn't take it, though. We understand God took it. God took it away from uh, Laban, and he gave it. He gave it to uh, Jacob. Uh, brethren, times were hard for Jacob. That's what stands out. Time, time again, he faced hard circumstances. I mean, do you remember when the Pharaoh asked Jacob? He said, "How old are you?" And uh, he said, "Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and I'm not nearly as old as my fathers before me." So uh, we don't need to detail the difficulties. We know all about the difficulties that the saints have with dealing with circumstances in this world. Jacob called it, he, he just matter of fact, they called it their pilgrimage. It was just a, it, that's what he called, that's what he referred to it as. It's, it's, a, it's a distinctly different walk. It's called a pilgrimage. And it's, it, it's marked along the way with these kind of circumstances. There's no way anyone can say that Abraham and his brethren, Jacob and Isaac, Isaac and Jacob, they had it easy. None of the, uh, Joseph and Daniel, that none of the prophets of God had it easy. Uh, who would say the holy prophets, had they, their, 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 way, their way was easy. Look at what they were called to say and the way they were called to live. The, uh, the, live. the list goes on and on and on. Uh, the apostles is on that same list. Paul, notably, uh, the, the apostle to the Gentiles, he's on that list. And on the very top of that list, we have the Lord himself. None of the saints of God, the saints, have had it easy. God wants his people to be ready to leave Egypt. That, that's, that's the circumstance. And so salvation is not easy. This is God's way. Our hope is based on the fact that it's not going to end this way, that it's, it's going to end differently, that God Actually, God is going to work it, all these things, for our good. The saints' hope is the expectation that God is going to bless. In the end, we know his blessings will bring advantage and increase. Like Paul said, I know this is going to, when he wrote as a prisoner, for, I know this is going to work out, or, or turn out, he said, for my salvation. Well, see, these are the things that accounts for the difference in the people of God, the difference that the world sees. As we follow the way of the Lord, the walk gradually enlarges, and the walk gradually increases. When the disciples followed Jesus, they followed him up to the city. The grave became steeper, and each trip became steeper and steeper. The Lord's leading was upward. With each trip disciples made to Jerusalem, it, 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 was, a, it was a harder trip. They had faced things they hadn't faced the last time. He is continually moving us. The Lord's continually moving us higher and higher, and he's moving us into places we have not been. In order to keep up, we have to ask the Lord to increase us. And we can depend on him because he's for him. I've just been waiting for you to ask me. Kind of thing. There was a time when the disciples, they just had to flat out increase us. Lord, increase our faith. We understand that the, we understand that the increase of God is the manner of the kingdom. We understand that. So we'll pray. For increase, we pray for it. We'll we'll fully enter into it then when it presents itself. Well, full purpose of the heart, Barnabas would say, increase belongs to God. 
However, nowhere has God said he would increase the work of men, just men, what men are doing. And time and time again, we see God will not increase without our involvement. <laughs> we got to be involved. Co-laborers, the scriptures say, we're co-laborers doing the work of God. God did not provide Noah a boat. Uh, he had to build it. He had to build it according to the way God wanted it built, too. We see the involvement of the creatures of God in his work according to his design. There is a design to what God is doing. There is a pattern for the body of Christ. This is a pattern. It's a spiritual one where Christ is ahead and we are the members. That's all a pattern I ever seen. Paul said one of us will plant and the others will water. But without God, there is no increase. In this day of salvation, increasing in God is the normal thing. Back in times past, when I look at our, our good brethren, this was a rare thing. The difference is, it's owing all to what Christ Jesus has done. He has come, brethren, and he has ascended, and he has sent the Holy Spirit, and he has made the way possible for men to be received of God. This is an incredible thing that God has done in Christ Jesus. God has put away sin through Christ Jesus. This is what made these things possible. This is what has changed the focus. This is the way, this is what's changed the way God looks at men. Sin has been taken away. This is what makes the this this is what makes the cross of Christ the most focal point. Christ endured the cross. For this is how, and this is where sin was removed. Many things in salvation have got to consider, like we said. But one thing has got to be made known, that all the blessings flow to men through Christ Jesus because of the, what I just mentioned. The sins of the world have been removed, and yet little. Huh, yet little how, how this is known. I, it's almost an unbelievable thing. The church has failed. You've got to say it. I'm telling you, you just got to say the church has failed. I'm sorry. They've failed to make this known. I've lived through it. They have failed to make this known. We have failed. I can say we have failed to make this known. This is the truth, and the world don't know it. This was the foremost message of John the Baptist. He declared it. Every, I'm sure we got it recorded a few times in Scripture, a couple of times, but I, I, I can bet you that he said it every chance he had. We thank God we can preach it here, and we make, can make this known. Our basis, it is our basis for the increase of God. Let me back up and say it a little better than that. For our basis in the, in the increase of God, there's three things to remember. God is well satisfied with Jesus, and we are accepted in him. God has determined the kingdom will fill the whole earth. So those are the three things that I, I kind of picked out that as a basis for our increase. We speak of this often among ourselves, that, only, that God can only receive those who are in Christ Jesus. And in every case, brethren, what we're talking about, in every case, we're talking about those who have made every effort to do whatever needs to be done to stay in fellowship with him. I, I bet you the disciples never let Jesus out of their sight. They were probably winded on their way to Jerusalem, just trying to keep up with him. They hold on, he'll take a break right up here. But they didn't let Jesus out of their sight. This is why Paul would exhort us to walk in the Spirit. Yeah. Now, we renewed, see, with this, increasing in the knowledge and understanding of God. This can only come, way, come by way of growing in the knowledge of the Lord. The unity in Christ is by the Spirit of God that dwells within us. Now, here in our text in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul is not talking about something entirely new. He has to approach something that he, he teaches everywhere, but he had to do it in a certain different way because of who he was talking to. What kind of word is, uh, what kind of work, and what kind of word is Paul describing here? Well, it's a work of the body of Christ. It's exactly what it, it dawned on me when I was putting this together. One plants, the other waters, but it's God who gives the increase. We very, we very well know that God has designed the body of Christ to work and operate in this certain way, this is exactly, and this is the only way blessing increase and all the good things of God will come to us, the church, which is the body of Christ. Now, I don't think it can be made any more plain than Paul makes it in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 to equip the saints to, the work, to do the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. We know these like the back of our hand, this, these texts. 
And in verses 13, it, it gives the details to what end this is done. The most central work of the ministry is to edify and build up one another. That's the purpose of equipping the saints, to build one another up. And, of course, we know building other, everyone up, one another up, is the increase of which God gives. Make us bigger and larger. Not numerically necessarily. The brethren actually do build one another up. The brethren actually do this. We actually do it, the scriptures say. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Amen. Equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry is the work. As scriptures tells us, this flat out scripture, is the work of the one who descended, who is also now ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. This is Christ Jesus, brethren. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Amen. So in this letter, that we, at this particular part of we looked at, that Paul is just trying to establish to the brethren that don't, don't be giving all this attention to men because all the increase belongs to God. Amen. And so... That's, this is what I give to you today, brother.